I, <coughs> I really, uh, what a good weekend last weekend with Craig and Colette. Just good ministry, <coughs> good to have them. And I see Mark and Judy. Um, I just, yo, man, I tell you, every time I'm preaching, I'm, I'm just, I'm really, I've been, what's the word? Just agonizing over this every time I speak with you because I feel like it's, it's such a time where we don't need to waffle and say a whole lot of things. We really need to hear from God. And so I always feel the weightiness of it when you're preaching God's word to try and hear what God is saying and try and communicate that. So if you don't mind, let's just all pray for me. Father, we thank you this morning um, for your word. I really ask you to help me to get out of the way, Lord, of um, you so that we can hear you, we can hear your heart. I know when you speak, things change. When I speak, Lord, it's just another person speaking, but I know that when you speak, things change. And this morning, Lord, we, we want to hear your voice. We really do want to hear what's on your heart. And Holy Spirit, you've already done so much this morning. You've already done so much, and we pray, Lord, continue in Jesus' name. Amen. So I found this verse, and uh, it's in James chapter 1, verse 19, and uh, I like the message way it's put. It says, post this, and if it was written in our day, it would have been on all your Instagram, social media, and whatnot, but because it was written in those days, post it at all the intersections. Dear friends, lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue, and let your anger straggle along in the rear. God's righteousness doesn't grow from human anger. And you'll know that scripture. I love that. Lead with your ears. Have you ever led with your ears? I'm trying to think, how does that look like? And I know this verse is in the context of relationships where it's saying, when you're having an argument, when you're dealing with people, make sure you're listening before you just blurt out and speak. And actually make sure your anger is right in the back of the queue. It seems like uh, in our day, most people are leading with their emotions in the front. And then their mouth after that. And then they're listening, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and so uh, you'll see another version there, the NLT says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. And so there also in that verse, you, you find these three parts of communication. Listen, speak, understand. You get it? And we must learn how to speak and must listen, learn how to listen. And we must also learn to understand. And um, I think what we listen to will impact on our emotions. And I think at the moment, the world's emotions are heightened. And um, a lot of people are leading with their emotions in the front. I found this little headline. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, maybe we can put it up there. Um, this is the chief of the UN, he says, one, we are one, one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. <laughs> uh, it's not that bad. I'm just saying, I feel like emotionally people are there. I feel like marriages are one miscalculation away from a nuclear annihilation. And so we really need to make sure that we are not leading with our emotions. We are leading by listening. And what we're listening to, we have to un understand that that has an impact on, on, on our emotions. And we also got to understand that our anger doesn't bring about God's righteousness. You doing all right? So I've got four questions. We're going to answer them. And hopefully uh, it will help us. Number one, what is God doing? I think if we want to lead with our ears, we need to hear what God is doing. The second question is, what is the devil doing? And I think it's important for the last two years or so. Um, I can remember when, when COVID first came and we were uh, 
I was chatting with friends recently again about those traumatic days, those first two months. We were trying to figure out how to broadcast and all that. And I was saying, Lord, help me. How, where is the enemy coming from? How do we, how's the war changed so that I can make sure that we are standing our ground as the church of Jesus Christ? And I think it is important to know what the devil is doing. And it's also important to know what the world is doing, how people are reacting to what God is doing and what the devil is doing. And then, of course, the most important question is, what should I be doing? What should I be doing? Because I do believe that God has called, especially us as believers, to lead in the world, to lead ourselves well. And so that's what we're going to do. So is that all right? Question number one, what is God doing? And I'm not preaching this like this is what he's doing. I'm saying this is what I feel he's doing. He might be doing other things, and you can tell me as well afterwards what he is doing. This is what I think and I believe he's doing right now in our world. Number one, he's building his church. Matthew 16, verse 18, I will build my church, and the powers of hell will not conquer it. That word build is the word to construct or confirm, to be in, to build up, to edify, to embolden. Jesus is building his church. Now, uh, I just want to remind you that the church is built in this context, um, in the face of this onslaught of the powers of hell. Did you ever notice that? I will, And that's why if you're finding it hard to do church, if your church life has been hard, I actually I understand because the church is built in the context of the onslaught of the powers of hell. So it makes sense to me when I, when I see how it outplays. And, and you might say, well, what, what then is the focus of Jesus on the church? Why is Jesus focusing so much on the church that he, he builds the church? And by the way, why is the powers of hell so focused on the church? You know, we don't always understand uh, the, the, the significance of this, but, but if you read the next verse that Jesus explains why, and that's in verse 19 where he says, well, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will uh, or first bound. I loose before I bound, but just undo and redo. Whatever you uh, bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Isn't that amazing? The only entity on the planet that has the keys to unlocking a kingdom that can break chains, that can release captives, that can transform lives and heal the brokenhearted is the church that Jesus is building. And that is why Jesus is intensely busy with his church and um, you're going to remember that the keys of the kingdom, the very founder of the church has entrusted to his bride, the church. Only we can unlock that kingdom. Only we can release that kingdom on the earth. That's the way God's made it. And you know, Jesus inaugurated that kingdom. He came and introduced it. He started it. But it's going to come to a climax. It's going to culminate as it says in Daniel chapter 7, where it talks about Jesus. And in verse 14, it says, He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All people, nation, men of every tongue worshipped Him. And His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The church is the agency through which the kingdom comes. Now, if you want to cut off water to Durban, you just destroy the one aqueduct that's supplying all the reservoirs because that's the source of which the brings the water. to. You, you understand, right? You, you, you know what that is, right? No water. <laughs> you do understand. So... This is the interest in the church that the devil has and the powers of hell have, is that she has the keys to unlock this kingdom. And so you and I, we need to be building with Jesus, right? Knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another and build each other up. 
build each other up. Why? Because I'm building with Jesus. I'm building the church that Jesus is building. And when I'm building with Jesus, it's an agency that can release the kingdom of God. That's what God is doing. He's building his church. Doing all right. Second thing he's doing, he's shaking all the nations. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 7, we've read it. He will shake. Do you know what the word shake means in Hebrew there? It's the word, I don't know how to say it. It's like rash. It's like rash with extra ash. I don't know. It's like rash. I don't know. But it means to make afraid. Listen. It means to make afraid. It means to move. It means to shake. It means to make tremble. You know, when, 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 you're, when, when, when something happens to you and you're shocked, you, you would say, I'm shaken. I'm shaken. It means to disturb or to topple. And God is doing this. God is doing this. And, and you can find the New Testament version of this in Hebrews 12 verse 26. It's a New Testament thing. It's not only what, what he said in Haggai. Old Testament is a picture of what is to come, right? And in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 26, when God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. Do you see that? It shook the earth. It's different to an earthquake. There's an epicenter in a specific place, and there's a quake. This says he shook the earth with his voice. And now he makes another promise, and here's the promise. And I'm sure we can claim every promise, right? And every promise is yes and amen in Jesus. Amen? How's this one? Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all creation will be shaken and removed. And you know that word remove? It's like when you've got something in your jacket and you want to get rid of it, you shake it. The last little while I've been making waffles. I don't know if you wanted the invite for the original ones. But you take the flour and you know you've got lumps in it and you put it in that sieve and you, you have to shake it to separate things. Shaking separates. Shaking disturbs. Shaking moves. And it says here, um, verse 27, this means that all creation will be shaken and re be removed so that the unshakable things will remain. I want you to understand what God is doing when he's shaking. He's bringing down the temporary so that the eternal things can come. Because you see, the nations without God is lost in eternity. And so it's not because God is angry or God is like, it's not his wrath. He's shaking things so that the, the shakable things can come can go away and be moved, and this eternal kingdom can begin to rise up inside of us. Because it says there, um, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe, for our God is a devouring fire. You see, when the eternal comes, you don't fear the things that people fear. When your hope is in what is temporary, then of course you tremble. Of course you're shaken. But when this eternal kingdom is, is, is being built inside of you, you're actually in awe of God. You're in awe of Him. Not of, of what's happening, but Him. And so I want to, to just remind us the source of the shaking is God's voice. The extent of the shaking is everything, all creation. The purpose of the shaking is that that which is eternal may remain. Do you remember this? Luke chapter 4 verse 5, the devil led, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, but he led Jesus up to a high place and he showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want. And notice Jesus doesn't correct him. And so when God is shaking, he's shaking the things that people are putting their faith in. 
And he's shaking the kingdom of darkness that's behind that. You're doing all right. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Our response to the shaking should be gratitude because we live in the goodness of God. We've received an eternal kingdom. Can never be shaken. Say praise God or hallelujah or something. I'm sorry, say something. Are you ex- uh, you're ex- shaken. The third thing that God is doing, and we're going to talk about just now the strategy I believe the devil's using, but he is filling his house with glory. He's replenishing, and I know you've heard this, but this is what God is doing in a time when the world is becoming more toxic and, and, and leading more with emotions. And as the shaking is happening, uh, there is a fear and a trembling that's happening. So this eternal kingdom is, is coming into the people of God, and God is filling his people with glory. And that glory is an unreproducible glory. It's an un disputed glory of God that cannot be bottled or reproduced. And I'm telling you, as time goes on, that glory is going to shine brighter and brighter. And the distinction between the world and, and the glory of God is going co- to be greater and greater. And so that word full is to replenish and to satisfy, to consecrate, to take up the space. And you know Haggai 2 verse 9, he prophesied, The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, it's just a bit of a catch up here. He's prophesying and he's saying, God's saying the glory of this temple will be greater in the future than it is in the past. He can't be talking about this temple that they are building because it was nothing like the temple Solomon built. He can't be talking about the temple Herod would restore because that temple is nothing like the one Solomon built. He's talking about the temple where it says people washed with the blood of Jesus, living stones, you become, your body becomes a temple of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying the glory will be greater. Why? Because it's eternal and it's lasting and it's not external. It's not gold and silver and buildings and all that, but God is going to take his glory and he's going to put it inside the heart of a human being. And it's, it's going to be eternal, not shaken, not changed. That's what he's doing. And we see the New Testament again telling us this in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 8. Um, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what is glorious has no glory in comparison to the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater the glory which lasts. Isn't it amazing? In this world that's being shaken, there is the church with the keys of the kingdom, ministering with the power of the Spirit, and God is filling her with His glory, and it's eternal glory that will not fade or pass away. And so I just quickly want to remind us what that glory looks like, just so that w- there's no confusion. I've been saying that the glory of God is revealed through his character. And you remember Moses in Exodus said, God, show me your glory. What's it going to be like? What is, it, what is your glory like? What is it like, God, being in your presence? Show me your glory. And you know what God does? He takes Moses and he puts him in the cleft of a rock and he puts his hand over him. And in that position, God says, I'm going to show you my glory. It's like In the New Testament, when God takes us and he puts us into Jesus, the rock, and through a work of his hand, he can put his glory into my heart. And it's like God in me. The glory, the very glory of God in my heart, existing in my life for all eternity, it's going to increase this glory. More of God. More of God, more of God, because he's put me in Jesus and and this wonderful work of his hand that he's done. And this is what God is doing, I believe, in these last days. He's going to fill people with his glory. 
and the world's going to be raging and carrying on, and there's going to be those who carry the glory of God in their hearts, unshakable, giving thanks to God in awe of God. And everyone's going to, we know what's going on, you know what's going on, and we're going to be, wow, God is amazing. And God passes through His glory. You know there in Exodus 34, verse 6, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger. Slow to anger. You know, anger is a general emotion, I find. It's like when you're not sure how you're feeling, you're generally angry, right? And it's the amazing thing about God. In His character, in His nature, there's this part of God that's so glorious, He's just slow to anger. I think we can skip over this very quickly. But this is very powerful. And that's why I'm saying in these last days, the glory of God is going to become so distinct from, from the world. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving. Forgiving. Wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Forgiving. It is God's character. He's going to fill His house with glory. Are you there? All right, we've got to talk about this guy. <coughs> What's the devil doing? Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, tells us about this inauguration of the kingdom of God when Jesus came. I uh, remember Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Can you remember that when the disciples came back and they said, well, demons are subject to us in your name. And he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And you, you read the same picture here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. It says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who live in the heavens rejoice. But terror will come on earth and on the sea. For the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing his time, that his time is, is that he has little time. <laughs> I was trying to say it too quick. <laughs> My language correct there, Ali. I was speaking Mexican. Um, that was a flashback. Let me say this. Jesus came because he loved the world. The devil comes in great anger. There is a difference here. And what's reflected in the devil's character is opposite to God. Are you seeing this? And despite America's war on terror, let me just say, this says terror will come. Terror will come. Like I say, I think the, the world is a far more angry place now <laughs> than ever. It's just anger is boiling over. And um, it is the spirit of the Antichrist. Let me just say that because Antichrist means opposed to or opposite to Christ. And this is how we know we're in the last hour, not because we follow a calendar. It's because we know the spirit of the Antichrist is, a, is, is working. And Antichrist is anti-God and it's anti-slow to anger. Anti-forgiving. And it's hard not to get swept up with it. So I, I, f I feel like this guy is up to, this is what I feel. And again, you might tell me, I'm not talking like I'm the authority. This is what the devil is doing. I feel like this is something he's busy doing. This is part of his strategy. Number one, to bring terror. He, to bring terror, he drains our emotions and wears down our patience. People generally are mentally and emotionally uh, uh, drained. Bringing trauma, pain, and injustice, he heightens the levels of frustration through hurt and offense um, to, to push the stress levels up. He's using fear. Honestly, like I say, who, is, who likes to see a headline like that? Uh, guys, listen, just want to tell you today, we're one miscalculation away from uh, nuclear annihilation. Well, that's like, it sounds like you guys are solving the problems. 
that we, we feel much better. Thank you, United Nations. Do you know what I mean? No, I think he's, height, he's heightening, he's using fear and, and traumatizing people. And, and then I also feel like, you know, he's bringing a lot of change in a short period of time to disorientate people. And then, like, he's, he's keeping people so busy, like Pharaoh, that they isolate themselves. They disconnect from what they should be because they're busy and they're frustrated and the, the stress level is high and the anxiety is high. And this is what he's doing. That's not shaking. He's causing chaos. Yeah. God is shaking. You see, when God shakes it so that the temporary can give way to the eternal. And the things we trust in, God removes them so we can lean on Him. This is not shaking. But that's not all. I feel like what He then does is He, direct, he gets us to direct that anger towards other people. There's so much misdirected anger and emotions. Now remember James Lead, lead with your ears, not with your anger. Anger should strangle, st what's it, strangle in the back? Strangle, be strangled. It's also good. They should change that translation. But uh, the devil's putting on the pressure and then he's getting us to direct that anger towards. And often it's a misdirection. And you can see this in the municipalities, I suppose they're a reflection of the principalities, but <laughs> in the municipalities, in the nations, in, in, in societies, in families, there's the anger and frustration, and then it's directed at somebody. Unleash it, vent it, blame. You've got to blame someone. This rage and anger is spilling over. You're doing all right? Hard not to get swept up with it. And of course, he he's dividing. And the reason he's doing that is Matthew 12, 25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Let me say this. However great your nation is, however great your family is, however great your, your, your kingdom is, if it's divided, according to Jesus, it cannot stand. Remember that. What do I feel the world is doing? And we, we're coming in for a semi-lower altitude. What do I feel the world is doing? Man, I tell you, the world is just getting swept up by this. Second Timothy 3 verse 2, For people will love only themselves and their money. You know what's causing terror? You know what's causing fear, right? It's because people are loving only themselves and their money. They will be boastful, proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. Did you notice that? See, when the glory of God fills my heart, I w I w I'm grateful. And I worship Him, fearing, standing in awe of Him. But when I'm only worried about myself and my money, I actually become more ungrateful. And they will consider nothing sacred. They'll be unloving and unforgiving. How's that? It's the fake glory. It's the opposite of the glory. It's the anti-God. It's the anti-spirit. God reveals His glory. He is loving, faithful, compassionate, forgiving. The world is becoming a less loving and unforgiving place. You doing all right? If ever there's a time the world wants to see God authentically, His glory in our lives, it's now. It's now. And God wants to fill His people with His glory. It's the blessing He wants to give us in these last days with a greater glory 
than we've ever seen. Not temporary, not makeup, not jewelry, not outward, not buildings, not success, but inside of us, the very glory of God. As the church ministers by the Spirit of God, brings righteousness to man, each one of us in the rock, Jesus Christ, the work of the hand of God, his workmanship. <sighs> so what should we be doing? Well, number one, don't listen to him. Lead with your ears. Lead with your ears. And if you listen to all this negative stuff, it's n that will lead to frustration, which will lead to anger, which will not produce the righteousness of God. What we need to do, make sure, like we sang this morning, we're building our lives on His pattern, building with Jesus personally and relationally, that we allow those things in our lives to be shaken, that, that should be shaken. Remember I said shaking is not causing the chaos. God allows the things I trust in to be shaken so that I can come back to the eternal things, which is God. And thirdly, we, I think, you know, we're in a church recently, and um, the guy said to me, I don't know why I'm so emotional because the whole point of the preacher is not to <laughs> lead with emotion. <laughs> but he was saying to me, you know what, I, I don't know if our people know how to receive ministry. Because since before COVID, we, we haven't done that. You know, we haven't laid hands on people. We haven't ministered and... Um, I really feel God say it's time for us to learn how to receive from God again because we can't just push through on our own. We need this glory of God to fill our hearts again. But God can't fill something that's full already. We need to learn to receive from Him. All right, so quickly. Build according to his pattern. Be a good steward. What should we be doing? I know what God is doing. I'm listening to what God is doing. I'm aware of what the other guy is doing. I know what the world is doing. But the big question for me is, what should I be doing? And I know I should be building with God. Building what he's building. That's what we've been preaching the last couple of weeks. Build what he's building. Build the church in the midst of the onslaught of the powers of hell. Let's build what he's building. Um, let's build according to his pattern. And I want to say this, be a good steward. Take care of yourself. You know you are made up of body, mind, most of you at least, body, mind, <laughs> soul, spirit. See the Alex and the aliens. Eh? <coughs> Delete that from the thing. Um, do you know that, have you ever, you, you've got to live a balanced life. Have you ever tried to, uh, uh, let's just think about this for a moment. You've got to take care of your mind. You've got to take care of your soul. You've got to take care of your body. And you've got to take care of your spirit. If you don't feed your spirit, you're going to have a problem in this time. And let me just say, you can't cast out calories if you've tried. When it's a physical thing, you've got to do something physical. Do you know what I mean? You can't run and expect God to answer your prayer. I'm just going to run more. No, you have to actually pray. Running doesn't make up for the lack of prayer. I'm just trying to say, you can't spiritually look at the food and say like, anyway, this is going way beyond what we should. Learn to get refreshed. You know what makes us humans different to everything else in creation? We are responsible. Think about that word, like Stephen Covey says, response able you are response able you can respond you don't have to react you are response able 
I know there are things you can't change, but there are things that you can. Change the things you can. Your emotions, it's your responsibility. Your mind, it's your responsibility. Are we doing all right? Be good stewards. Remember, you're not your own. I know we think we are, but we are not. We are bought with the blood. It's in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, because some of you are like, oh, what? I belong to who? Yes, you are not your own. You belong to Jesus. He bought you with his blood. Be a good steward of you. Lead yourself. So take care of yourself. Lead yourself. Um, and that just means you've got to do some training, man, in your speaking. You know that a gentle response diffuses anger, but a sharp tongue kindles a temper fire. This is, again, the, the message Bible. Gentle answer turns away wrath. We have to learn to speak because in a world that is inflamed, what I say, you see, I must lead with my ears, then my tongue, and then my anger. Not my anger first and my speaking first and I'm inflaming everything else and just making it worse because I have to train myself how to speak in the world we live in. We're no longer living in the world we used to. Have you noticed? The world I grew up in does not exist. And I mean, I should have been born in the 60s because the music, I mean, honestly, I missed it. But still, even, even so, the world you and I grew up in doesn't exist. This is a new world. Let's adjust. Let's lead ourselves. You're doing all right. Let your conversation always, 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 did I say always, be full of grace. Glory of God, people, training themselves how to speak. Lead yourself, dealing with conflict. Uh, Ephesians 4.26, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. I was we were marrying a uh, guy and a lady recently who I don't think is born again. And one of the things I said to them is like a good marriage is made up of two very good forgivers. Good forgivers. And you might say, like, oh, forgiveness, that's a weakness. No, that's the glory of God. It's the glory of God. And can I say this? Uh, um, if your brother sins against you, don't post it on Instagram. Or Facebook, and if your brother sins against you, actually, actually, what you should do is go and tell him in private. You don't even go tell the pastor. Oh, he took my seat. What must I do? If your brother sins against you, you're supposed to go yourself and speak the truth in love. And you know, when you're speaking in love, there's a lot you can say. You can speak truth when it's in love. A lot of how we deal with conflict, we're copying the world. Let's train ourselves. Let's lead ourselves. It's half past. Connect yourself. Remember the devil wants to isolate you. Each one of you are part of the body of Christ. Don't be disconnected. Live healed. What does that mean? Dudley used to say you got 30 seconds to get over it. I think now we got 15 seconds. Things have changed. What do I mean by that? Be a good forgiver. In fact, Galatians, you know, these things, it's, it's, if you read Proverbs and all that, Proverbs 19, 11 says, it's to a man's glory to overlook an offense. It's to a man's glory to overlook an offense. <sighs> all right. Let these things be shaken out of us quickly. Bitterness. Ephesians 4.31, I love that verse. It just says, get rid of all the bitterness. Get rid. Let it be shaken. Honor um, or, or dishonor, let it be shaken out. You know, husbands, it says there in the same way, 1 Peter 3.7, husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. So, uh, she may be weaker than you are, and in some cases not. 
but she is your equal partner and God's gift of life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Do you know when we dishonor each other, you can stand on your head and pray and Honda, Kawasaki, Shandai, one day, you can do what you like. God will not answer your prayer because if you're dishonoring someone else, your prayers won't be answered. Get rid of offense. It says an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. And unforgiveness. Just shake it out. Let it be shaken. Learn to receive from God. Can we stand? Is uh yes. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. The equal partners, Matt Hurd. Learn to receive from God. So this is what I sh I must do. You know what I've learned when it comes to receiving from God, these are some of the things I've 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 missed. I've I have to, I find I'm like in a relearning process. Number one, I've had to learn how to be still. I don't know about you, but it's like there's so many voices, so much going on. I've had to learn, because when you want to receive from God, um, I think it's R.T. Kendall said, and the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. You know, a dove doesn't sit on something that's moving and and un, like disturbed it's that perfect quiet you know when the dove is sitting on the well not Durban pigeons but usual doves if it's sitting on the corner of your roof and you slam the kitchen door they fly away I've had to learn how to be still again shut out the other voices my own voices uh, only have one I've had to learn again how to wait. I've had to learn how to wait because in a world that's getting busier and feels like there's less time, I, I'm ru I find myself rushing, rushing here, rushing there, doing this under pressure. I've had to learn to wait, wait, just wait. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. up with wings as eagles to learn to expect from him again to hear from him again I've had to learn how to yield again and can we just I mean you just close your eyes I'm speaking I'm just trusting God for us to receive from him that's all just to receive from him however you do it I'm just saying these are things I've had to learn to learn how to yield again. You know, sometimes you've got to take charge. You've got to do it. You've got to make it happen. Oh, but when you come to God, it's more like you just have to yield. Give way. Give way. Give way to God. That yielding is a surrendering. It's a letting go. It's allowing Him to do the stuff that only He can do. It's to not resist Him when He. When it's, it's yielding. It's being still. It's waiting. It's waiting. And then I've had to learn to open my heart to Him again. Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and I knock. Isn't that amazing? He can open doors, no one can shut. He can shut doors, no one can open. But the door of my heart, I have to open. Invite Him, trust Him. just receive from you this morning, Lord. Will you minister to us, Holy Spirit? Will you minister to us, Lord?
need to fill your house with your glory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Michaela. We went a bit over time. Apologies. There is coffee. Please stay and enjoy each other's company and get connected. Don't be isolated. God bless you. Have a great week. Please pray for us on Thursday. We fly up to some pastors in Pretoria. We're there and then also there on the weekend. So please pray for us. We'd appreciate that. Amen. God bless. Thank you.